you notice that they're cast into the lake of fire? If this was a Vincent Price movie, they'd be dragged into the lake of fire. Real slow. They'd be dragged into the lake of fire. They'd be clawing and screaming, ow! And confessing, yeah, praise God! Well, that's not the way God casts them in there. It's quick, cast them. Ain't getting no suffering here. We've done it, and they're not being punished. Oh man, am I happy to tell you that they're not being punished there. God's not mad at them. This is simply the result of being a son of Adam. They die just the same reason for we do. We're Adamic, we're enemies, and we die. It's not a punishment, God's not angry at them. You simply gotta trade in your body for a new one. And it just so happens that these folks aren't appointed to live for the eons. Now, I'm gonna, I'm winding down. You say, that's not fair either. That's not fair that they shouldn't live for the eons. Hey, let's not talk about unfair, because these people are going to live for eternity. At the consummation, they're going, to, they're going to live for eternity. You know, the common if the common lot of all mankind would be the second death, no one would have any complaints. We have eternal life. Do you know how short the eons are compared to eternity? It's, not, it's stupid to even talk about it, because there is no comparison with time and eternity. Not fair if our... If everybody was going to the second death, if all mankind was going to the second death, if we live, we die, we're judged, we go to the second death, we don't live for the eons, if that happened to all mankind, no one would have any complaints. The, sec the Lake of Fire, for one thing, sounds hideous, doesn't it? Wasn't there a Vincent Price movie called The Lake of Fire? Huh? Well, there should have been. <laughs> A Stephen King novel? No? It's terrible. It should have been. But I got good news for you is that God's thoughts and revelations concerning the lake of fire are not man's. Thank God, right? And it's not Christians either. Because the Christians have a, a Christian theology, standard Christian theology, has an idea of the lake of fire that is hideously not God's idea. Coy told us that. God has ideas that aren't our ideas. But Christian doctrine is like a Stephen King novel. It's worse. It's worse than a Stephen King novel, all right? These horrible stories. So, but again, as I told you concerning uh, Matthew 25, I'm not going to water down this judgment of the lake of fire, which is the second death. not going to water it down, but I'm also not going to give it the fanciful, uh, ornate theology of Christianity, which is not in line with, with Scripture. I'm going to look at it for what it is, not for what it isn't. So let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Let's get right into it. Revelation 20. And I'm going to start with verse 7 so we can get warmed up into this. That's a little Lake of Fire joke. Warmed up. We're going to get warmed up into this, starting with verse 7. <laughs> yeah, the Lake of Fire joke. <laughs> Gene's getting me back for... Well, people laughed at mine. Revelation 20, verse 7. And whenever the thousand years should be finished, Satan will be loosed out of his jail. And he will be coming out to deceive all the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to be mobilizing them for battle, their numbers being as the sand of the sea. And they went up over the breadth of the earth and surround the citadel of the saints and the beloved city. And fire descended from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the adversary who was deceiving them was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the wild beast and where the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. Now, anybody here or on the tape, if you're reading your King James Version or the New Inconsistent Version, the NIV or the NASB, you'll probably read forever and ever there. That's not a good translation. Going to get it. Well, for, for one thing, have you ever thought of this? They're tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night are time words, aren't they? Day and night. So that doesn't go hand in hand with eternity. That's evidence that, that forever and ever is wrong. And again, it's plural in the Greek. That's why I'm reading eons of the eons. If the con translators were going to be consistent here, they ought to have said forevers and forevers. Well, man, they put you in a loony bin for writing that. So they twisted it. They ignored the plural. They ignored the genitive case in the Greek, which gives you the of. And they ignored a lot of things to make that forever and ever. Again, this is a better translation. I'm reading out of their concordant version. Verse 11, I perceived a great white throne and him who was sitting upon it from whose face earth and heaven fled and no place was found for them. And I perceived the dead, 
the great and the small, standing before the throne. Wait a minute, how can dead people stand? Going to get to that. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is a scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. Verse 13, And the sea gives up the dead in it, and the dead and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they, death and the unseen, I'm sorry, and they were condemned each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. I want to point out to you, first of all, we talked about Matthew chapter 25, that the Orthodox religion wants to put everybody in that judgment. They want to throw the whole lump in there, where the context is talking about nations, isn't it? That's crazy. Well, you, you, you find the same craziness here. People want to say that all of humanity is being tormented in the lake of fire, when in fact, we're pointed out very plainly that there are only three tormented in this lake of fire, consciously tormented. Who are they? Adversary, look at verse 10. The wild beast and the false prophet, they are tormented. Now, if those three are picked out, I believe those are beings. Some might teach that these are uh, a company of beings. I don't, I don't think so. I think they're beings, supernatural beings. They and they alone are tormented in the lake of fire. Now, these three are obviously picked out. If everybody's being tormented there, why would you mention that these three are being tormented there? Not all mankind is being tormented there. For everyone else, it is plainly called the second death. Going to get into what death is. The second death. Going to get to that. Look at verse 12. I perceive the dead, great and small, standing before the great white throne. Well, this is a figure. I said, how can the dead be standing? You notice there's also a scripture verse somewhere that says the deaf shall hear. Well, deaf people can't hear. It's a figure of speech known as retention. We're calling them dead to identify them as ones who have recently been dead. They are the dead. They're not really dead now, but in order to separate them from those who have been alive, these are the dead. You see, the deaf will hear. At the time they hear, they'll no longer be deaf. But we're identifying them as those who recently have been deaf. You follow me? It's a figure of speech called retention. Just the technicality there. So the sea gives up. I perceive the dead standing before the great white throne. Scrolls were open, and another scroll was open, which is a scroll of life, and the dead were judged. There is judgment here. That's why I say I'm not watering down this lake of fire, or this great white throne, lake of fire scenario here. Not watering it down. Before the lake of fire, we have judgment. Let me quickly point out that the lake of fire itself is not a judging the judging takes place while these folks are alive. There's billions of people here, folks. The dead, the great, and the small. There's billions of people, perhaps, I don't know the number, standing at this great white throne. This is what they call the general judgment. And they're judged in accord with their acts. <clears throat> Very interesting that the Greek word here, ergon, their acts, not their sins. You say, what's the difference between an act and a sin? Well, Christ took away the sin of the world. These have been covered by the blood of Christ for their sins, but they're judging accord with their acts, what they did. It's not whether you win or lose at the great white throne, because really, Christ died for them. He is the Savior of all mankind, remember that, especially for believers. So He is their Savior. He saved them. But there needs to be an adjustment of their acts, what they did. It's not whether you won or lose, but how you played the game. That's the way I look at this. It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you played the game. So there needs to be an adjustment of acts. That's why the Scripture is very careful not to call, say that they're judged for their sins, but they're judged for what they did in relation to other men. They might have been sins, but the issue here is not sin. It's an adjustment, just like we're adjusted at the, the Bema, the dais of Christ. This is not a church picnic at the great white throne. People say, you, people tell me, you guys preach that everybody's going to heaven. They tiptoe through the tulips. But we don't. Because this is not a pretty sight, this judgment here happening at the great white throne. 
Turn to Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Romans 2, I'm going to start with verse 5. Now, okay, 2, 5. Yet in accord with your hardness and unrepentant heart, speaking of man, those of man, you see in verse 1 of chapter 2, those among men who have hardness of heart, they are hoarding for themselves indignation in the day of where they are hoarding for yourself indignation in the day of indignation and revelation of the just judgment of God, who will be paying each one in accord with his acts. That word should kick you back to Revelation 20. I believe that this passage in Romans 2, 6, concerns the judgment we just read in Revelation 20. They're judging in accord with their acts. To those indeed who by endurance in good acts are seeking glory and honor and in corruption, they receive life aeonian. That's another word, not in your King James Version, but properly translation of ion in the Greek. Yet to those of faction and stubborn, indeed as to the truth, persuaded to injustice, he will be paying indignation, fury, and affliction and distress on every human soul which is effecting evil. Does that sound like a church picnic to you? Affliction, distress, indignation, fury? But this is going to happen at the great white throne. We don't teach judgment. I beg to differ. This is serious judgment. And we shouldn't water this down. People are happy to hear that we teach judgment. They think we teach a tiptoe through the tulips. But no, God has to adjust. These have not been these at the great white throne, and folks, this is we're not going to be there. We don't appear at the great white throne. We don't go to the second death. We're not cast into the lake of fire. We're made alive many years before this. And we appear at the Bema, the dais, to be adjusted. But it's not a judgment, it's a requital for our acts. When does this judgment take place? The reason I keep going to the great white throne is because it's tied in with the lake of fire. Obviously, the great white throne is tied in very closely in this passage with the lake of fire. When does the judgment take place? I read this verse earlier, Revelation 20, verse 5. The rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years should be finished. So the folks who appear at the great white throne have been dead at least a thousand years. But this includes the, deads of, the dead of eons past, those of Noah's day, for instance, who were disobedient, all those of Noah's day who perished in the flood, they've been dead for a long time. They're not roused for judgment until the great white throne. A lot of people are going to be here, folks. A lot of people. And you know, one of the protests to the salvation of all is that people think we're saying that uh, these people are going to get exactly what we have. And that, that's, there's an there's a ugly part of a human heart that doesn't want that guy to have what I have. But if it helps anybody who has a little corner of their heart that way, maybe some of us do, it's true. We are going to have more than they have. We're made alive before this. And again, these folks have been dead at least for the thousand years. The dead do not live until the thousand years are finished. They don't partake in that thousand years. So if you've got somebody who objects, you can comfort them. Well, don't worry. You won't have to be with those sinners during the thousand years. You don't have to be, you don't have to rub elbows. I hear that, man. You mean I'm going to be rubbing elbows with sinners in heaven? You telling me God's going to save sinners? Boy, they got a short memory, don't they? No, you don't have to worry about it. They're not going to be there for the thousand years. They're going to be dead. Let that comfort anybody who doesn't want them to get what we got. And they ain't going to be around during the new heavens and new earth either. We're going to find that out. That they're going to go back into death. That bugs some people. Why would you send them back to death, Lord? They just come up. Why send them back? I'm going to tell you why. So we, he's the Savior of all mankind, 1 Timothy 4.10, especially of believers. See, the especially salvation includes the thousand-year reign when we're alive and reigning with Christ and this eon, which is the new heavens and the new earth. We're alive during that time. These folks aren't. There is a big difference. Also, note something that's overlooked constantly in orthodoxy, that this throne is white. That's overlooked. It's white. But to hear them teach it, it's black. 
because these people now are cast into the lake of fire and they're tormented there, which is a lie. It's a lie. They're not tormented there. They're dead. Going to get in. They're cast there, and they're going to be there forever. The way orthodoxy teaches. Man, if that's the case, we better paint, get some spray paint out, and spray paint this throne black. But it's not. It's white because everything done there is going to be right. And it's going to be based still on the cross of Christ. These people are saved. They're saved, but they got to be adjusted. And it's not their portion to enter into life of the eons. It's just not a portion to them. This is not a wild, furious scene here. It's not wild and furious at the great white throne. It's orderly. There might be weeping. There might be that fury and indignation. But it's done rightly. It's done justly. And it's adjusted to the sinners. You know, not everybody sins the same. Maybe it's too soon to talk about it. But... We lost a beautiful woman in Princess Diana, didn't we? Was she a believer? I don't know. She was certainly a philanthropist, did good for all mankind. But that's not the criteria we know. We know that God's pre-designation of us is shown by a faith. There are many people who are good people in the eyes of the world. Good people. But they haven't experienced that faith. I should say God has not chosen, chosen to give them that faith yet. So it could be. It could be. I'm not the judge of the earth, thank God. But it could be that Princess Di is going to be standing at the great white throne with Charles Manson. You see what I'm getting at? Or Hitler. Why don't we just... Let's, let's, uh, I better not bring up Mother Teresa. Um, I better not bring up Mother Teresa, so I won't. This has to be adjusted. you got to adjust it at the great white throne. Because not everybody sin the same. And you can't do that in death. You can't do that in the second death because death is the great equalizer. You see, death is the great equalizer. An infant is no less dead than Hitler's dead. Well, death can't be a punishment for sin. That's a big problem. People think death is a punishment for sin. It's not. It's not a punishment. I'm going to get into what it is. Then we got a picture of this principle God operates on in Matthew chapter 12. We got a picture of how God operates. We, you don't have to go there. Let me just mention it. We got Ninevites. Jesus said there's going to be Ninevites who will rise in the judging and condemn. His generation, the generation of Jesus' day. Why? Well, because those Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. And more than Jonah is here. Did their repentance gain them Eonian life? I don't know. I don't think so. Apparently, the Ninevites are going to appear at the great white throne. But they're less guilty, they're less guilty than the Jews of his day were. So there's going to have to be an adjustment made. In verse 42 of Matthew 12, we read of the Queen of the South, Queen of Sheba. She was going to be roused in the judging. I believe it's here at the great white throne. She's going to be roused. But she came to give honor to Solomon, but she wasn't a proselyte of Judaism. We don't have any indication that she was giving that saving, giving, given saving faith. But yet she was a good woman. But yet, and she's going to be roused into judging with this generation, Jesus said, those infidels standing before him of the Pharisees, and we'll be judging it. So this judgment of the great white throne which precedes the lake of fire has to be fine-tuned to the crimes. There's going to be some good people there that just were not believers. You understand that. Philanthropists, good people that didn't care a lick about God, didn't have saving faith given to them, they're at the great white throne too. That's why I say Princess Diana might be there with Chuck Manson. We got we got problems if the punishment is death because there's no adjustment in death. So we have to take care of that while they're alive at the great white throne. 
And again, if the great white throne judgment is followed by eternal torment or annihilation, then that throne is black. That is ridiculous. We have a righteous judgment here. Everything's made well. Everything's made good. Now we're going to follow it with eternal torment or annihilation? Why judge then? Why adjust everything when, with your, when you're done with it, they're going to be annihilated? That's like a piano tuner coming to your house. And he tunes a piano and he adjusts it and he gets his ear down there and he gets his pitching fork and he does a great job. And he's done and it's finally done and he says, whoo, that's a relief. Damn it! And he throws it down into the basement. That's stupid. After he's worked that hard, now he's going to throw it down into the basement. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no. The lake of fire is not eternal torment. It's the second death. Going to get to that. Why is it important? You've got to know about this. You've got to know about this. Because this is the backstop. What do I mean by backstop? This is where everybody ends up that's not, quote, saved. This is where those unbelievers end up. All of them, right here. This is the backstop. This is where they end up. You know, it says that the inhabitants of Sodom were destroyed, didn't it? They were destroyed. Well, how destroyed were they if they rise in the judgment? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? How destroyed are they? So if people tell you, well, God rained fire and sulfur on Sodom, and those people was destroyed. They was annihilated. Really? Well, it says here that all the dead, great and small, are going to rise at the great white throne. And then they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. So really, how final is the destruction of, Sol of Sodom? You've got to get back to this. If you can answer this, because this is where they end up. This is the, this is the end. This is the terminus so-called, for unbelievers. This is their final hurrah, if you will. <laughs> and if you take it orthodoxy's way, this is the last breath they'll ever take. But if you look at it God's way, you're going to see something completely different, I'm happy to tell you. If this death is eternal, then God cannot be all in all. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 15, 28, we find out that His plan, His goal, is to be all in all. We find that Jesus Christ, God, is the Savior of all mankind. If this second death is eternal, none of those things can be true. He can't be the Savior of all mankind. Because you know what? A Savior of all mankind has to save all mankind. That sounds so simple that a kid could get it. But the Savior of all mankind has to save all mankind. Or He's not the Savior of all mankind. Hello? So if this death is eternal, that can't come to pass. Neither can God, want, God going to be all in all come to pass. The lake of fire is the second death, verse 14. I want to convince you that this death is just what it says it is, death. There's no suffering For, the, all, for mankind in the lake of fire. The suffering belongs to the beast, adversary, and the false prophet. There's no processing going on in the lake of fire for mankind. There's no purification there. I know it's often, the argument is often made that the sulfur here is, uh, theon is the Greek word for sulfur, which contains the root for God, theos. So, the idea goes that this was a purification and that those in the lake of fire are going to be purified. Those of mankind in the lake of fire will be purified. But there was also sulfur that rained upon Sodom. It was fire and sulfur and it killed them. This fire and sulfur kills mankind. It kills them. The reason that theos is in there is because the theos is simply the subjector it's not necessarily referring to the ultimate God, the ultimate deity, our Father, but it is often referred to any of the heathen deities. The the they were gods also, small g. And it just so happens that the heathens used sulfur in their worship of these deities. So that's why you got theos in there. Christianity teaches that the second death is torment. Some of our, our own brothers have taught that the second death is a reform, some kind of reform school, where there's reforming going on. But, no, this is what it says it is, death. A lot of the false ideas of death are based on a misapprehension of a very important verse. I've got to point that verse out to you. It's Romans 6.23. You've heard it. 
For the wages of sin is death. This is out of the King James Version. Of course, we have bad translation there. For the, you've all heard this. Who hasn't preached this out of Orthodox camp, huh? For the wages of sin is death, yet the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm first going to show why that's wrong, why that translates. It's very wrong. I'm going to show why it's wrong. Then I'm going to tell you why it's important to know that it's wrong. The word wages in the Greek is mystos. Mystos. That's the Greek word that King James translated wages. A wage is a final reward you're going to get at the end of the day. You work all day, you punch the time, you get your wage at the end of the day. But that's not the Greek word used here in Romans 3.23. The Greek word is opsonion. Opsonion, which means a ration. That is something that's provided a continual allowance. Something that's rationed out is you have a continual allowance. It's not the wage paid at the end of the day. It's something that you get all along the way to keep you going. You say, well, what's the big deal? I don't understand. I'm going to make it plain to you, I hope. In the Concordant Version, they translate Romans 6.23 this way. I'm going to tell you why I'm talking about this. For the ration of sin is death. That's the Concordant Version. The ration of sin is death, yet the gracious gift of God is life eonian. There's that eon word again. Life that endures through the eons in Christ Jesus our Lord. The reason this is important is because if we think that death is the wages of sin, if we think that death is the punishment, if we think death is what you get because you're a sinner, then we're going to make some false, get some false ideas about this second death, the lake of fire which is the second death. Because as I said, death can't be the punishment or the wage for sin because you can't adjust it. Death can't be adjusted. An infant is just as dead as Hitler. There's no adjustment in death. Death is not the wage of sin. Death is not the punishment for sin. Now, Ionian life is the expectation of a believer, isn't it? The gift of God is Ionian life. That's the second part of that verse. It's an expectation. It's something that's continually your source of joy. Likewise, a slave of sin has death continually hanging over him. That's what's rationed out to the slave of sin. He constantly has death hanging over his head. That's his constant expectation is death, death, death. It's not the wage, it's the ration. It's something that's given out continually. Not the punishment. It's not the wage at the end of the day. Why is this important? Again, I just told you. Because if you think that death is a penalty of sin, you've got a big problem. You've got a big problem because death can't be adjusted to sin. And this false idea of death, that it's the punishment for sin, this has forced orthodoxy to make the second death into a conscious torment, which we assume will be adjusted. You know, they teach there's different compartments in hell, you know. And it also has led some of our own, our own brothers to make the second death some kind of second mortality where those are reformed. Because if you think that death is the punishment of sin, you have a problem because no, that can't be adjusted. So we have to make them alive in death. We've got to make them alive in death so we can adjust it to the crime. But no, all the adjustment takes place at the great white throne while they're alive. That's important to know. I want to show that the second death is literal. It's important that I show this. It's important to show that the second death is literal because even though death is still an enemy, I understand that. Death is an enemy, but it's still one of God's mercies. All right? Adam did a couple bad things. Adam transgressed. He broke a law. Rick told us the only law was that he was a sinner, a transgressor, he disobeyed. He transgressed, and for that he suffered. God said, because of what you have done, I cursed the soil, and I cursed the ground, and you have to toil by your sweat. So for what Adam did, he suffered. It affected his soul. But Adam did something else that was even worse. He hurt God's feelings. He offended God. It was, he became an enemy on that day. Not only did he become a sinner, that's bad enough. He became an enemy. And because of his sin, he was going to suffer. And it was going to afflict his soul. But because of his enemyhood, he was estranged from God because he hurt God's feelings. 
That would result in His death. To die shall you be dying. He became mortal. And that would eventually lead to His actual death. And that affected His spirit. You see, what He did affected His soul. He suffered. But what He became, for what He became, He was given death. And death is what is passed through into all mankind. And it ain't your fault. I know this is tough to follow. Stay with me. It's not your fault that you die. It's not your fault that you die. Everybody dies. Not everybody. Some aren't going to die. But the infant dies. I hate that, don't you? Don't you hate that idea of infants dying? Hardened criminals die also. Something's not right here. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. It's only not fair if you think death is a punishment for sin. When you see that death is simply the result of being a son of Adam, then you can rest. Okay, we're not being punished for what we did. Death is not a punishment for what we do. You suffer for what you do. And you die for what you are. You die because you're an enemy, but you suffer because you're a sinner. And that's why we have the acts dealt with. Their acts are being dealt with at the great white throne. What they are is dealt with by death. Take a criminal. You have a, a criminal today, we usually punish him, don't we? We give him certain degrees of punishment. If you rob the... If you rob the 7-Eleven, you get a certain degree of punishment. If you rob a bank, you get a certain degree of punishment. If you kill somebody, a certain degree of punishment. But when a criminal becomes so rank that he's, he's just, you know, he's insane or he can't be, I guess not insane because you get him off the hook there, but if he's a incurable, then what do we do? We give him the death penalty. And in civilized countries, it's done in as painless a manner as possible. Because what he's become, he's become incurable, so we just kill him. In a painless way, just get rid of him. It's the same with mankind. Mankind for his actions is given suffering, but simply for what we've become, it's death. And death comes to all, irrespective of what we've done. Infants and crim criminals all die. God is not punishing us with death. Death is simply the result of what we've become, which is enemies estranged from God. So let me review this for you before I get back to the lake of fire. Sinners, as sinners, we suffer because of what we do. And that's what's adjusted at the great white throne. But because we're enemies, we die because of what we have become in Adam. And I'd love to go into Romans 5 because Christ answers both of these things. He suffered and died and it meets us where we need it. But the suffering is for the act of sin and the death is for the fact of estrangement. This is critical to understand this, to realize why these people die. A lot of people have problems with this, that these people are dying again. Some say that death is unfair at the great white throne. Unfair! But they don't understand that death comes not because of what they did, because of what they are. But if you get rid of the false notion that death is the wages of sin, the ration of sin is death. This is something we experience now. If you get rid of that false idea that death is wages, then you won't try to force this lake of fire, which is the second death, to be something it's not. You won't force it to try to be something it's not if you see that it's not given because of our sin. It's not unfair. You know, we're justified now, eh? Right? We're justified. We're conciliated. We still die, don't we? Nobody else, we don't scream about that being unfair, do we? But all of a sudden, we got these folks at the great white throne, and the way we teach it is they're adjusted at this time. They're shown that Christ is their life. Perhaps it's, it's at this time that they acclaim that Jesus is, is Lord. Perhaps it's, it's at this time that they understand who He is. Now, why do they have to die? That's not fair. They die for the same reason we die now. You've got to trade in these bodies to get new ones, as Rick was just telling us. These bodies can't carry away the loot we're going to get. So you've got to get new bodies. God's not mad at them. The second death is not angry. We put them in the lake of fire. You know what it is? It's simply that they're not appointed to live during the eons. And this is God's way, God's merciful way of keeping the final eon from their consciousness. I realize in Scripture that death is sometimes used figuratively. I understand that. But not so here. Uh, we heard that some are dead in trespasses and sin. Obviously, do you, you know what you look like when you're dead? You ever been to a funeral home? I have. I hate it. The dead have a hard time uh, greeting you, don't they? The dead have a hard time breathing, sitting up. They're dead. 
And it figures sometimes, Scripture does use it figuratively. Like, let the dead bury their own dead, Jesus said. That throws a lot of people off. Let the dead bury their own dead. Well, Jesus, how can dead people bury other dead people? Jesus said, it's a figure of speech. They're not really dead. It's just like you're dead to the world. People who are dead in sin, they're like, it's like they're asleep. They don't know what's going on. So, you say, well, how come this death, how come you're telling me this death is literal? How come this death can't be figurative? Because this is a metaphor. Back to the English school. I'm going to send you to English school for a little bit. Back to English school. You know what a metaphor is? You know what a simile is? A simile says something is like something. Right? There's a verse in Isaiah 40, verse 6, that says all flesh is grass. Now, if that was a simile, it would have said all flesh is like grass. A simile is easier to understand. All flesh is like grass. Oh, how so? Well, like the grass dies and withers and your flesh is the same way. I can understand a simile. But a metaphor is a bold way of saying it. It doesn't use the word like. It says this is that. Now, is flesh literally grass? No, you don't shave. You don't mow in the morning. You shave, right? You don't mow. It ain't grass. If you go into the meat shop and order a, a pound of hamburger and the butcher gives you a pound of grass... You want your money back, right? He could say, well, Scripture says all flesh is grass. Oh, that's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. All flesh is like grass, but it's a bold way of saying it. Just like Jesus said, this is my body. Boy, that's caused a lot of confusion, hasn't it? He held up a piece of bread and said, this bread is my body. Oh, wow! This is Jesus. Now we're going to kiss it and worship it? This is Jesus. He said it was Jesus. Jesus was like, oh, no. if only he would have said, I'm about to tell you guys a metaphor. Oh, boy. But it was a metaphor. It's a bold way of saying something. It's not literally true. But I want, to give you a, I want to give you a big clue as to a metaphor. This is a law of language. When Jesus said, he held up the bread, said, this is my body, in a metaphor. The, a metaphor consists of three parts. Two nouns and a verb to be in the middle. Two nouns. This is my body. This bread, noun, is the verb, my body, another noun. All flesh, noun, is, verb, grass, noun. In a metaphor, both nouns, follow me please, both nouns on either side of the verb to be are literal. Always, always, always. It's a law of language. Why? Because we're getting enough strain trying to figure out the relationship between bread and Jesus and flesh and grass. The, the figurative part of a metaphor is in the verb is. That's the figurative part. That's the strain. But the nouns on either side are literal. They have to be literal for you to understand the relationship. You see, I have to know what literal grass is, and I have to know what literal flesh is in order to understand what kind of relationship you're telling me here. Jesus said, this bread, do you understand what, little, what bread is? Yeah, we understand what bread is. This unleavened bread is my body, my literal flesh. Now, he's not saying that this is my literal flesh. He's saying, but this literal thing... This literal bread represents my literal flesh. Both nouns are always literal in a metaphor, law of language. Coming back to the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. It's a metaphor. In other words, the lake of fire is the second death. It is a metaphor. In a metaphor, law of language. And I'm happy to tell you, God follows laws of language. A law of language, both nouns on either side of the verb to be are literal. The lake of fire is literal and the death is literal. You say, well, how do you know for sure this is a metaphor? i got a double witness for you. In a metaphor, we have something very strange that happens that doesn't happen in any other construction with nouns on, of the verb. With nouns that surround the verb to be. Whenever a pronoun, this is another law of language, whenever a pronoun is used instead of one of the nouns, which is what we have here, this, that's the pronoun, it's being substituted for lake of fire. This, lake of fire, is the second death. Whenever a pronoun is used instead of one of the nouns, and the two nouns are of different gender, which is what we have, the second death, thanatos is masculine, lake, limne, that's feminine, then the pronoun, this is in a metaphor, the pronoun is always made to agree in gender with the noun to which the meaning is being carried. 
and not the noun from which it is carried and to which it rightly belongs. In other words, the way it should work is the this, which is the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. This refers to the lake of fire. This should be feminine to agree with limne, which is lake, which is feminine. That's a feminine noun. You know the Greek has feminine, masculine, and neuter. It should agree with lake because that's what it rightly belongs to. This, the lake of fire, is the second death. But in a metaphor, something really screwy happens by the design of God. In a metaphor, this pronoun agrees to what, with what it's pointing to, death. And folks, that's exactly what happens here. This word, hutos, is masculine. It agrees with death. That's weird because it should agree with lake, which is feminine. So this is a metaphor. This proves it. And in a metaphor, it's literal. That's why the death is literal. Why are you taking such pains to tell us that the death is literal? <laughs> because I'm going to show you what a comfort this is going to be to you. Because you're going to have a lot of friends here. I got a lot of friends here at the Great White Throne. I got a lot of friends here. I got loved ones here. And I want to know God's revelation. I don't know about anybody else who doesn't interested in these details, but I want to know what God's doing, and I definitely want to know what's going to happen to my family, my loved ones, who I know died without being given belief. I got to know. Now that we know this is literal death, I want to go to Ecclesiastes. Don't turn there. I'll go for you. Ecclesiastes 9.5 said, The dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Why is this so wonderful? Do you know what God's intention to do, His intention with these folks is? Do you know what His intention is? 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 22, even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. The same all that were dying in Adam are going to be vivified in Christ. But it don't happen all at once. Verse 23, yet each in his own class. The first fruit, Christ, he's the first one, the only one so far, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence. Okay, that's us. Thereafter, the consummation. That's a third group. You say, how do you figure? How do you figure this is a third group? There's something real big that happens at the consummation. Go down to verse 26. At that time, he's going to abolish the last enemy. He's going to be placing all enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death. And there's only going to be one death operating at this time, and that's the second death. And those in the second death, at the consummation, will come out of the second death because he's their Savior. But in the meantime... Folks, in the meantime, they have no sense of the passage of time. You got a guy in the hospital. He's an unbeliever. He's dying. I've seen people die in hospitals. I used to be an orderly. I've watched the last expiration. And they're gone. Now, a thousand years might intervene, or two thousand years, but to that person, their next breath will be at the great white throne for their judgment. No time has passed. They weren't suffering in death because the dead know nothing, I just read to you. There's no work, nor device, nor knowledge in the grave. So to there, I'm taking practical, nuts and bolts. Let's, take, let's talk about an individual. Let's talk about your Uncle Harry that you saw die in the hospital. What's going to happen to him? God didn't give him faith. He takes his last breath. I don't care how many years pass to his next... You know how that works when you go to sleep? Sometimes you wake up in the morning, where'd that eight hours go? I've heard stories that say that, you know, I, I believe that if a man died in war and was shouting a command to his soldiers and he was killed by a grenade, he's going to finish his statement at the great white throne. <laughs> You follow me? That is beautiful. What a merciful God we have that there's no passage of time. That's why Farwell could tell us that we're all going to rise together at the same time. Even though some have died a thousand years ago, we're all going to raise together. Ain't that beautiful? Because to their knowledge, to the person's knowledge, the moment of his death was the moment of his resurrection. 
It's like, boom, 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 that faster than that. The moment of death is the moment of resurrection to their perception. I'm not teaching death ain't death. I'm just saying to them. My sister was in a near fatal auto accident four weeks ago. She's recovered. She's back at work. Thank God. She broke her hip. She broke her ribs. She had a ruptured, uh, she had to have her spleen removed. She, her bladder was ruptured. She had a collapsed lung. Today, it still bugs her what happened to 15 minutes. There's 15 minutes she can't account for. And she looked, she, it drove her nuts because she couldn't remember. Next thing she knew, she was in an ambulance. She said, I don't remember the crash. I don't remember closing my eyes. I don't remember saying, oh, no. I don't remember preparing for the impact. She said, the next thing I knew, I was in an ambulance. People were cutting my clothes off. And it drives her crazy today. I, there was 50, the ambulance report said that there, were, there was 15 minutes before the cops got there, before the ambulance got there. She said, I could have died and not known it. <laughs> right. Right. She could have died and not known a thing about it. Next thing she knows, glory. Next thing she knows, vivified. Next thing she knows, ruling and reigning with Christ. Oh, man. Oh, man, she almost died. She almost died. And the thing that shocked her is she said, I never would have known it. I never would have known it. You notice that they're cast into the lake of fire? If this was a Vincent Price movie, they'd be dragged into the lake of fire. Real slow. They'd be dragged into the lake of fire. They'd be clawing and screaming. No! Confessing, don't forget. And confessing, yeah. Praise God! Well, that's not the way God casts them in there. It's quick, cast them. Ain't getting no suffering here. We've done it. And they're not being punished. Oh, man, am I happy to tell you that they're not being punished there. God's not mad at them. This is simply the result of being a son of Adam. They die just the same reason for we do. We're Adamic. We're enemies, and we die. It's not a punishment. God's not angry at them. You simply got to trade in your body for a new one. And it just so happens that these folks aren't appointed to live for the eons. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm winding down. You say, that's not fair either. That's not fair that they shouldn't live for the eons. Hey, let's not talk about unfair. Because these people are going to live for eternity. At the consummation, they're going to, they're going to live for eternity. You know, the common, if the common lot of all mankind would be the second death, no one would have any complaints. We have eternal life. Do you know how short the eons are compared to eternity? It's, not, it's stupid to even talk about it. Because there is no comparison with time and eternity. Not fair if our if everybody was going to the second death, if all mankind was going to the second death, if we live, we die, we're judged, we go to the second death, we don't live for the eons, if that happened to all mankind, no one would have any complaints. Why? Because we are roused because of Christ and we're vivified and we live for eternity for crying out loud. These little tiny little sliver of time called the eons, not fair. Not fair. You know what the miracle is? The miracle is that any live during the eons. That's the miracle. The miracle is that any of us are blessed to be alive during the two eons when God gets His glory. That's the miracle. The miracle ain't that some people don't get to live during the eons. The miracle is that any get to live during the eons. That's the miracle. Don't feel sorry for these guys in the second death. They don't know. They have no consciousness of this long, 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 long eon. To them... They're cast into the lake of fire. Next thing they know, consummation. You're going to feel bad for them people? They just get an eternal life. How are you going to feel bad for somebody that just get an eternal life? I don't understand that. That's right. They go back to the unseen. They go back to the unseen. They're dead. They are dead. I want to end with a... They're in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Plainly stated. You know, I, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. I gotta, I gotta say this. The lake of fire isn't literally the second death, because I did tell you that it was a metaphor, right? The lake of fire, fire isn't the death state. If I have a match here, that's not death, is it? Is a match death? No, it's fire. So fire, the lake of fire is not literally the second death, because it's a metaphor. But the, this literal lake is said to represent literal death. You see, it's so closely related to it because it causes death that it's put for it in metaphoric form. It's put for it. A literal fire, a literal lake, 
is used to figuratively represent, that's the verb to be, a literal death. Okay? I'm going to. Oh. That's right. That just shows you that everybody that's been dead is going to be there. There's no death operating beside the second death. If you can eliminate the second death, oh God, oh God, if you can eliminate the second death, then you have liberated the only death in operation. You have liberated every human being that's in there because death is going to be abolished. Death, same word, thanatos, same word, death is going to be abolished. Same word is used in Revelation 20.14. That's going to be abolished. That's how God becomes all in all in 1 Corinthians 15.28. I'm going to end with this verse. I'm going to read it out of the Scripture. I'll just read it out of memory because we all know it. 1 Timothy 4.10. Well, I'll, I'll read it out of the Scriptures. Faithful is the saying, starting with verse 9, and worthy of all welcome for this we are toiling and being reproached that we rely on the living God who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. You know what that especially means? It means that we live. We have the blessed, gracious privilege of living during these stupendous eons when God is going to get such glory. What a rare privilege. You know, we would have no complaints if we went to the second death and were vivified at the consummation, but God has graced us with an incredible gift. And don't ever forget it, that we have an especially salvation that they don't have. Why? No reason except God's choice. That is so humbling when you realize that you're the same as them. You're the same as them. If it weren't for God, you'd be an Adolf Hitler. If it weren't for God, we would be like them. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. The only difference between you and those who stand at the great white throne, and we don't stand there, thank God, we're requited at the day. It's the only difference is God chose you because His love does not consider the object. Agape love does not consider the worthiness of the object. It loves because it loves. And He's graced us with that apart from us. And I'm going to tell you, in this evangel, there is no boasting whatsoever. Father, I thank You for this Word so rich in detail. I thank You that You have chosen language to reveal Yourself to men. And I thank You also that in Your mercy, for us to understand the Word, You follow the laws of language. I also thank You for giving all of us here the desire to know what You have said the interest to be here, and I thank You for the grace bestowed on us. I also thank You for even the vessels of dishonor. I thank You that Your judgments are right, that the throne is white, and that Your judgments are just and they make things right, and that death is used to withhold consciousness of the passage of time in order that You may bless Your creatures with true life eternal so that we may all, with one voice, glorify Your precious name. Amen. A lot of people ask me, Martin, what's going to happen at the end of the eons? No, I wish that was the question. But the question is, what's going to happen, happen after the eons? People want to know what happen, what's going to happen after the eons. After God becomes all in all. Martin Zender, what happens after all in all? I'm telling you, only the world's most outspoken Bible scholar would be asked a question like this. This is an intense question. I've devoted intense study to it, to the question, what will happen after all in all, after the eons? And the best answer I have for that right now is, I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows because... The farthest look we have uh, in Scripture is to the end of the Aeonian times. We know what is going to happen at the end of the Aeonian times. God will be recon God will be well. God's conciliated to the world now, but at the end of the Aeonian times, the world will be conciliated to God. Every single being will be brought back into unity and oneness with God. That's the meaning of the phrase. God becoming all in all in 1 Corinthians 15:28. Also, death will be abolished. Uh, we get that wonderful news in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. So that's uh, 
those two things are going to happen at the end of the eons. Um, <clears throat> you're finally not going to have any long waits at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, you'll you'll go to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles at the end of the eons, and you'll just step right up to the counter, and you'll be waited on in an efficient and a polite manner. So that's what happened at the end of the eons. Uh, there are people who are concerned, and I understand this, like that at the end of the eons, when God is all in all, they're afraid they're going to lose their individ individuality. They think that we're all just going to become this uh, nebulous, or they're hoping we don't, but they're not sure uh, that we all become this nebulous, indistinct cloud of oneness, you know, that just hums like... And uh, no, the cloud is will not hum. It'll kind of whistle like... No, there will be, there will not be a nebulous cloud of oneness. We are all individuals. God becomes all in all. That's the key, the second all. <clears throat> the first all is God becomes everything. And the second all is God becomes everything and everybody. So you will retain your distinct personality, your distinct characteristic. You will be known as you. You will recognize other people. You will look over and say, hey, there's Martin Zender. There he is. He's not in his car anymore. Yeah, you'll be able to know who's who. So that's great news. And another question I get about the end of the eons is, will we see God? And this, it, this answer that I give, which is the right answer, by the way, I have a habit of that. <clears throat> it disappoints most people. And I'm going to explain why this should not disappoint you. Uh, I don't believe we will ever see God. God is absolutely invisible. People are disappointed. It's like, you got to be careful because what you're doing when you say you're disappointed and not seeing God, you're basically just, um, just be careful, you're, you're insulting Jesus Christ. Because it's like you're setting him aside. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is Jesus speaking. If, you see, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he told uh, Thomas, Philip, somebody. And um, it'd be like him telling you that, and then, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, but, you know, I, I'm sorry, but step aside, please. I want to see the Father. Step aside? Jesus, step aside. I want to see the Father. I don't think you want to do that. don't think you should do that. And I know that when you are snatched away, you won't do that because Jesus Christ satisfies everything, every yearning we have for the Father because he's the perfect image of the Father. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. I think it was Philip. So show us the Father and it will suffice us. We'll be happy to show us the, show us the Father. Well, y if you've seen me, you've seen him. I represent, I stand for, I expound upon everything he is. So, you don't need to see the Father. Forget about it. Don't be, don't, just forget about it. You'll see Jesus Christ. Now, Here's the other question I get it concerns time. Uh, it's like, uh, Martin said that we want to be in eternity. I want to feel eternity. Oh, it's going to feel like a warm bath. I think it's going to be delicious eternity. Oh, I'm going to swim in eternity and through eternity. You're going to swim through eternity? But if you're going through it, it's not eternity. You see, through is a time word. <clears throat> you being here one minute and there the next minute or the next second, that's not eternity. Many of you want to travel at the speed of thought. So do I. But that can't happen in eternity because even at the speed of thought, you're going from one place to another. That defies eternity because we don't even understand eternity. I told you, I used to tell my kids, God had no beginning and no end. And they, what do you mean? They would lose their minds. Their little heads were about to explode. They'd jump up and down on the bed and scream. What do you mean he had no beginning and no end? They can't handle it. I'm glad Marcia didn't call the county on me, telling the kids something like that. That's it's brutal. Shouldn't do that to people. Tell them that God has no beginning and no end. You just hear it and go on. You can't, don't meditate on it, don't concentrate on it, because you'll never figure it out. So we're not going to be in eternity when we're snatched away. We're not going to be in eternity. We're not going to eternity. Our bodies are being changed. We're going to be made immortal. 
But where does it say we enter into eternity? No. We're going to reconcile the universe to God. We're going to bring all the strange creatures among the celestial realm back to God. In order to do that, we have to be in the celestial realm. And when you think that you're in the, the celestial realm, people assume that once you cross that boundary into the celestial celestial realm, you cross the boundary into eternity. No. No, you don't. I don't think we'll ever enter eternity. Now, I used to think that I used to think that after the eons ended, I'm going to talk about the purpose of the eons before I close here, Ephesians 3, 11, that that was the end of time, and then eternity proper began. See, I used to think this myself. Eternity proper began after the eons. So in other words, we there's no question that we don't enter in, into eternity in the eon 4, eon 5. There, there's, there's no question. But the question is, at the end of the eons, God becomes all in all. So we're at, when we come to the end of the Eonian times, when God's all in all, then can we enter eternity, Martin? Can we? No, no, I'm not going to let you enter, enter eternity yet, or ever, because here comes the question again: What happens after the eons? I don't know. So everything I'm going to say now is speculation. Okay. Uh, I used to think the New Earth somehow was gone after the eons. I somehow thought time was gone after the eons, but I don't think that anymore because scripture doesn't say that. Where does it say that the new earth comes to an end? No, God's worked and been looking forward to the new earth for since the creation of the first one, the wreckage of the first one and the future wreckage, wreckage of this one. Uh, we have no indication that the new earth expires. It's gonna be great. Why would it expire? And we don't know that time stops. The assumption is, well, after the eons, after the Aeonian times run their course, time must stop. Now, where does it say that? These are the eons. These are created for a purpose. That is for God to bring everything back to himself after he creates everything. Ephesians 11. The purpose of the eons, which he makes in Christ Jesus. The purpose of the eons. These five eons, we're in the third one, to our future, were made for a purpose. And the purpose is to, for God to create everything and then to rec reconcile everything through Christ. That's the purpose. Very simple. For God to create everything, put everything through an experience of evil, humble everything via that experience of evil, educate all creatures by an experience of evil, bring them back to himself, educated, wiser, smarter, and being able to appreciate good. Appreciate good. I, I often say we're going to feel good for eternity. I know that. I often say that. Maybe I should stop saying it. I don't know. I mean, technically it will be eternity because time will go on and on and on. But time going on and on and on is far different than eternity. Eternity has nothing to do with time. When I'm at a conference teaching on the eons, the first question I ask, is eternity a long time? If you think so, raise your hand. People raise their hands. I go, everybody, is eternity a long time? And then I convict them all of error. No, you're wrong. Eternity is not a long time. Eternity has nothing to do with time. So when I say eternity, I should stop saying it. I, I should say time will go on and on and on. And uh, things are going to, things are just going to, reach a perfection at the conclusion of the eons after the purpose of the eons has been reached. It's going to reach a state of perfection and it's going to continue on in a state of perfection. It will continue on. God's, God has no end. We, Christ has no end. We in the body of Christ, we're immortal. We can't die. So you can't end us no matter how much you want to. I'd like to end these people, but I can't. They're freaking immortal. Yeah, sorry. Don't mess with an immortal being. You can't do it. You're not going to end us. We're going to go on and on. So uh, at the end of the eons, we're all still distinct beings. We're all we're going to recognize each other. Uh, we're not going to see God, but we're going to be completely satisfied, completely satisfied seeing Christ because he's the per perfect image of God. Uh, and we're still going to be operating in time. After the eons is anybody's guess, but I would say that it's going to be great. I would say that time will continue. It'll just be a new kind of, it'll be a new time. It won't be the eons. It'll be the, the freons. 
or the peons or the neons. It'll be new. It won't be. It'll be the neonian times, the freonian times, but not the aeonian times. See, this is going to be a different set of time. The purpose of the eons will be fulfilled when God is all in all, and we're all going to feel really good. And um, even the members of the High Point Community Church, even they will be uh, elucidated in the ways of God. Yeah, they'll be the last people right before. They'll be the last people to get the truth right before Satan. 